Hi, I'm Matt Hill. I'm the curriculum designer here at MRU. It's our slide walkthrough videos. We're going through our intro to econ new unit plan. And again, just going through the slides, just try to give you an idea of what we were thinking and how, uh, you know, sort of what is unsaid on the slide and how you might, um, you know, go through these in, in, a, uh, in a lesson. All right. So this day is all about uh, institutions. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a second for a bell ringer here. Have the students think about three different potential grading uh, uh, schemes. So, you know, you have your standard grading scheme A. Hey, you get the grade you earn. Grading scheme B, everyone just gets the average. Whatever the average in the class turns out to be, everyone gets that. If you get an A, but the average is a B, you get a B. But if you get a C and the average is a B, you get that B. Another potential scheme is scheme C, the top five students have uh, five percentage points deducted from their grades and added to the bottom five students' grades. So a little bit of redistribution. And so the, you want the students to think about, all right, which of these schemes would they prefer? Which one would produce the most learning and what is fair? Again, there's not really any right or wrong answers. It's just to think about how different rules can affect uh, performance. Okay. All right. Reminding the students of economic growth, we've seen this fantastic explosion in economic growth in the past uh, 200 years. And one potential reason for this that economic historians think is institutions. Now, they economists use the term institutions in very, very broad fashion. Basically, that you want to think of it as the incentive structure, both the formal and sort of informal rules of society, the rules of the game. And with that bell ringer, what, what, what we're trying to show is depending on how you set the rules up, how you set the game up, you're going to have very different outcomes. All right. Then we have a nice, nice, uh, uh, one of my favorite videos kind of going over the concept of institutions and the importance of uh, institutions using highlighting the example of North and South Korea, which have very different institutions and then very different um, outcomes. Okay. A couple questions or some of the, what are the, uh, what was one of the important institutions mentioned in the video? Getting the students to think about those differences before they're presented between North and South Korea. All right. Then after the video, this has sort of been covered in the video, but just to go into it in more depth, what are the important institutions? Like what, what are these institutions that um, provide the incentive structure to get economic growth? And so we've outlined a few here that are important. There's more than this, but these are sort of some of the big ones. Private property, rule of law, stable government, and markets. Markets we'll cover in depth uh, tomorrow. So in this lecture, we just go into private property, rule of law, and stable government. Okay, so property rights. So economists think these are very important for growth, meaning like, all right, property rights is like, so people have rights to certain property and it's enforced. So it's like, all right, everyone knows who owns that. And if somebody tries to take it, that will be uh, stopped. Okay. Now, if you have poor property rights, this can lead to lack of investment. Like I don't necessarily want to invest in my house or in more importantly, maybe my, my crops. If somebody can just come along that has more power and take it away from me. Another problem, if you have poor documentation and poor property rights, you can't use it as collateral. If I have like a deed to my house, I can use that as collateral if I want to get a loan to start a business or something like that. Um, and then lastly, these unclear property rights can lead to a lots of disputes that just sort of don't promote uh, growth, that are a drain on society. To give a very, very uh, specific um, example, and this is real people in uh, in Cambodia, uh, rubber tree farmers invested in uh, their rubber trees, in, uh, in in growing them up, good irrigation system. And when the harvest was good, the neighbors basically were able to use political connections to take it, take those rubber trees, take those profits away from our uh, our farmers. And this is an example of weak property rights, where essentially, you know, whoever has the most power, whoever has the most connections can just kind of take what they want. And then thinking going forward, do you think local farmers will be incentivized to basically have this huge bumper crop of uh, of their crop going forward? The answer, of course, is no. Second important institution that we want to go in a little more in depth is the rule of law, which is the idea that 
we have the same laws uh, for everybody and nobody is necessarily above the law. Now, these are all ideals, by the way. The ideal is, you know, to have economic growth. The ideal is that you'd have strong property rights and rule of law. Of course, no country is going to meet this perfectly. But if you have a lack of rule of law, you're going to get unfair treatment. You're going to get uh, corruptions. People can be can bribe and be, uh, you know, above the law, not not uh, not subject to the same laws. You're going to get insecurity. We don't necessarily know what's going to be enforced, what isn't going to be enforced, and economic uh, instability. All right. Okay. Good. Good. Famous example of this is sort of like how there are different laws for different groups of people comes from Hernando, uh, Hernando de Soto, who's a famous Peruvian economist. And basically what, what he wanted to show is like how long it would take to set up a t-shirt factory going through all the official channels. This is a very bureaucratic country with lots, you know, it's very difficult to get all the permits, all the approvals. And if he were just doing it himself as a well-connected economist, he knows, you know, somebody uh, in the government, he could just get approved for his t-shirt factory. He said it would take about a week. He just needs to talk to the right people. And boom, there we go. Gets his t-shirt factory. But he hired students and says, go through the official process. Go go see all the officials you need. Bribe who you need to get all the actual proper documents. If you were just somebody you know, from the lower class, somebody that didn't have any con um, connections, see how long it would take. So you can have your students guess how long it took. It took about a year, um, close to a year of the students working eight hours a day to get all the officials, bribe everybody um, to get the approval. Now, in the case of Peru, what this what this means is a lot of small businesses are locked out of the formal sector. You know, they're still operating. You know, it's like, you know, it's a food stand um, here um, or maybe someone's like printing T-shirts like uh, in a warehouse kind of illegally. They're locked out of the formal se se sector and that hinders the business from growing. If you're not officially a business, you're still operating sort of kind of outside um, the law, but it really hinders you from growing. This is one of the consequences if you don't have a strong rule of law in your country. Now, stable government, sort of an obvious one. If you have that peaceful transfer of power, that provides good economic conditions for growth. You know, economic growth doesn't really happen when there's a lot of instability. You can't be sure. All right. Is this law going to be in place? You know, uh, in, in five years, is this permit I got going to be good under the next government? Am I going to fall out of favor of the government? And then, boom, my business is destroyed. So it's important to have this uh, stable government. As an activity, you can have the students try to design their own um, institution. Try to design an institution try to grade group projects. Now, if you're a teacher, you know it's very hard to grade group projects. You know, there's always a, a, a free rider issue where some students are not doing work. Maybe students, maybe a good student doesn't do work. Because it's like, why would I do all the work? So tr ask your students to try to come up with a fair grading scheme for group projects. And then also to recall day two, you know, they're essentially designing a policy here. What might be some unintended consequences of that scheme? Again, there's no right answers here. It's just getting them thinking through, like, how do we design policies to get to the outcome that we want? How do we design the institution so that the intention will match the outcome? Again, sort of calling back to day two here. Then surprise, ask your students to grade their group with that scheme. Again, this is not for real, but just ask them to go through the exercise to see how well their institution performed in this specific uh, case. All right. You want to ask them, how are our institutions similar to rules in sports? How are they different? Just getting them to do a little compare and contrast, analogizing to uh, the sports rule. All right, that is day four, institutions. We'll go to our final day, markets, uh, next. If you don't already have the unit plan, there is a link on screen. Or if you'd like to move to the next day, check out the next walkthrough video.